Okay, we're back live here at EMC World. This is Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of EMC World. Three days of wall-to-wall -wall live interviews. Yesterday, we ended up day two, 45 interviews in the book, 19 more today. We're talking to everyone we can, executives, entrepreneurs, startups, ecosystem partners, customers, whoever has the action, we want to talk to them, we want the signal, we're going to extract that and share that with you. I'm John Furrier, founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host. Hi everybody, I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. Rich Napolitano is here, good friend of theCUBE. He's the president of the Unified Storage Division at EMC. Rich, welcome back to theCUBE for the you know, millionth time. Yeah, it's good, good to see you again. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Good to see you guys. All right, good. Yeah, so um, you just came off your keynote. A uh, lot of good feedback that we heard in the audience. You know, we were, we were doing other stuff down here, but uh, take us through what you told the, uh, the customers. Yeah, so um, and, uh, feedback has been great, uh, so it's hard to know when you're in the, in the middle of it, but um, we wanted to take a different approach this time. Uh, we wanted to talk about kind of a vision for the future and a set of technologies. Uh, not about product, but about a, you know, a vision to enable your journey to the cloud. How do you transform from where you are today into the future? So we talked about, we talked about Viper and how that allows you to build out an agile, agile infrastructure, heterogeneous agile infrastructure, both heterogeneous down into different storage systems and heterogeneous up into other um, uh, into management frameworks. OpenStack, you know, uh, Microsoft, et cetera, VMware, obviously. Uh, and, then, and then we talked about uh, the implications of using fast software to meet the SL laser application by uh, dynamically adapting the storage subsystem to fit the requirements of the storage of your applications. Um, and then we, we talked about a new technology, which is in development, and gave people a look at kind of where we're going, and how do you, how do you use multi-core and flash to produce millions of IOs a second at extremely low response time. And, um, and we kind of declared latency is the enemy. And, uh, and then we continued and we said, you know, these things, Viper, you know, software defined data center is software, Viper is software, FAST is software, um, MCX, this technology around core scaling is software. And software has many properties. One of the properties software has is that it's malleable. You can add things to it. And so we demonstrated how malleable, where we took services, storage services, like virus scanning, and we ingested it into the platform, so you don't have a separate appliance. You can ingest that service and extend the value proposition of the platform. We did the same with RecoverPoint. We took RecoverPoint, that generally runs on a separate discrete appliance, and ingested it into a VNX, and demonstrated RecoverPoint inside the platform. And then we said, you know, these things are all software, right? So, you know, Viper, Fast, uh, MCX, this flexibility, but software also can be deployed in many ways. You know, I happen to use a Droid, and Droid runs on phones, it runs on tablets, same, same with iOS. Um, and so you can deploy your software in many ways. You can deploy your software in purpose-built platforms like a VNX or a VMAX, but you could deploy your storage software in ESX. So what we demonstrated on stage was a virtual VNX. We took the VNX stack and put it on top of VNX and delivered SIFS and NFS services on stage. And then the last piece was, we said, you know, you can even take that same software and push it up to the cloud. So we pushed it, we worked with one of our partners, Verizon in this case, we could do with AT&T or others, Rackspace, and we took a virtual VNX and instantiated it in the cloud. That's a lot, that was a long answer. No, it's good. That was exactly was just, what we covered. Gave, to, to, you just gave us your whole keynote in three minutes. Yeah, so that's it. Perfect. <laughs> so, help us, help us understand this whole software-defined thing and, and sort of where you guys fit. Um, we had John Rose on uh, the other day, I think it was yesterday, and he talked about how you know, all this function lives in middleware, it's very tightly tied to the controller and sort of how Viper begins to change all that. Help us understand where you fit in that whole, so Viper's this horizontal layer, Mm -hmm. You guys have this, we, so we talked to, uh, to uh, Brian Gallagher. Gallagher about this. Right. You guys have this hardened stack you right. know, that's been built up over right. you know, a decade plus. Right. So how does that hardened stack fit into this horizontal play? Sure, uh, that's a great question. We covered some of that uh, in, the, in the keynote, but I think it's important to 
refine that message and continue to repeat it because mm -hmm. it's a little confusing. It's complicated it's for people, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, when we think about Viper, you need to think about Viper in two ways. Uh, first, it's control path functions, which is federation of management. In other words, one of the challenges, you know, one of our core beliefs in EMC is you have the right tool for the right job, the right technology for the right use case. And so we have a portfolio of products, and that's always been in our DNA. But the challenge with that is each one of these is managed discreetly and separately. So Viper represents an aggregation of the APIs of, across these platforms. That's very, very important for our customers to make it easy to deploy all of our technology. Mm. So that's a control path function. Now on top of that, you can build other services like billing and metering and provisioning and simple provisioning, which can drive consistency of that experience down for our users across our platforms. That has huge value for our customers. Now since what Viper is doing is exposing control, control, control interfaces up based on RESTful interfaces, you can tie in our Viper management now into other frameworks like OpenStack and you know, VMware as well as, um, as, well as um, Hyper-V, you know, Microsoft environments. So that's powerful in terms of the control path side. Now when you cross, so you can build services on top of that, billing, metering, provisioning. And then on top of that, you can have some things in the data path. Now the things that make sense. The things that are in fact latency insensitive, like an object store. Mm. So build an object, an object key value pair architecture implementation that has its roots in Atmos and in Centera, and allow that object store to be built upon physical storage systems, because Viper has no physical, physical assets. It, it's, it's an abstraction on the control path and then in the object side. So you, the data's got to land on some disk somewhere. Now we happen to have a lot of great, amazing disk subsystems that have different properties. Price performance, availability characteristics, scalability, et cetera. So Viper overlays that value proposition. So sometimes Viper will be in the data path. Most of the time it won't be for more traditional applications like file-oriented applications and block. And so it allows you to aggregate these systems and build on top of the fabric of what's underneath there today. So they really are very different abstractions. So you'll, you'll access those lightweight services that you mentioned before, I mean, not to, I mean, not to you know, denigrate right. billing and, and, and right. provisioning, things like that, right. but then you'll access the, 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 the southbound That's right. uh, services you know, directly through your mm -hmm. protocols. Yeah, I mean, and we'll expose those interfaces so other people can plug into that framework, the, uh, the Viper framework, and it allows you to solve you know, our, our original, like sometimes I call our original sin, um, <laughs> which is that we have many, many of these and we need to basically aggregate them in a way that makes the experience across our portfolio easier to consume. So what's your penance? Is obviously, you know, Viper's you know, coding is part of that penance. Right. What, what, is, what do you have to do to, to play in that? So um, we need to just provide more consistency and make it easier for Viper to move forward, right? So Gallagher and I in particular, you know, when you think about, what, as we talk about the technologies, fast, deduplication and compression, we're, we're architecting them more and more similarly so the experience between a product can be more similar. You know, um, Iceland is thinking about you know, building out notions like fast cache, and so as they articulate those things, their interfaces need to be more and more consistent. It just allows us to innovate more rapidly and bring that value all the way up to step. So the criticism you're going to get, um, I mean, uh, Joe can talk about open, you can talk about choice, et cetera, et cetera, but the criticism you're going to get is, oh well, Rich, this is proprietary. Uh, so the answer to that obviously is going to be, okay, well if you can deliver function <laughs> that's greater than what I can get in open source, then that's okay, I'll, I'll, clients will pay for that. So you know, can you do that? How long of a lead do you have in doing that? And is that sustainable? So uh, it's important for, for us to have these frameworks that are open because people, customers have mixed environments. Mm -hmm. So you need to embrace that. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, you look at the rate of innovation in our subsystems, I mean, it's relentless. It's just relentless. And, uh, and that's the game, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I, I look at my roadmaps and I have things, you know, five years out that we're working on that are going to take that long to mature. And so, <laughs> um, you know, and you need to make those investments now. I mean, some of the stuff, that we're talking about now, you know, we started five years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, some of this is very, very complex system stuff. And that's the game, right? The game is, technology's our friend. Technology allows us 
to attack cost and complexity in the infrastructure if you're smart about it. And so we got to keep going. We can't rest on our laurels. Rich, I got to I got to ask you on the keynote. We're looking at some nice little graphics from the <laughs> uh, from the blueprints that they do the drawings. But you mentioned uh, a software-defined data center in your in your keynote. One of the things that's been mentioned is OpenStack. You mentioned that. So David and I have been talking about this open choice message that you guys have, and uh, it's just it's just it's too fuzzy, right? Back in the 80s, 90s, it was multi-vendor. It was a nice, clean message. Multi-vendor meant if you have a vendor, you can go with other vendors and things will work, there's some standards. It's evolving right now in this market. So what is the new multi-vendor? If multi-vendor was, you know, boxes, this works with that box, that port connects, this network works with that, you know, lower end of the stack. Now you got software to find data center, you have open source. And we were talking yesterday that open source is kind of like the new multi-vendor. So you got to play with the open source communities, you got OpenStack. Is that the new open? Is that the new choice? Is it like, hey, it's not about open source per se, it's just about working with open source? How do you view that as you lead your engineers and developers? So it's, it's all opportunity, right, at the end of the day. So if you think about a storage subsystem, we're agnostic to the host, you know? So in the old days, it would be VMS and Solaris and AIX, and, and uh, so now those words have changed. It's OpenStack, it's Hyper-V, it's VMware. What's any different, really? And uh, and so we need to continue to plug into the physical infrastructures, the traditional physical operating systems, and those virtual infrastructures. What's really changed? I am agnostic to that. You know, my business, more than 50% of my business is connected to Hyper-V. That's a fact, yeah. right? We're, we're driving more and more into the service providers for all of our products. We have, we announced VMAX service provider edition. There'll be a VNX service provider edition, which means we need to be in OpenStack because a lot of those guys are going to go that way. Um, so at the end of the day, that's what the new multi-vendor is. Is what, the environments or the software? Or it's the software that defines those environments, right? In the old days, it was the server vendor architecture, and there were more choices in the old days. You know, you had power, you had power, you had you know, alpha, you had you know, 20, 20 different Spark, right? 20 different architectures, and then they ran different operating systems. Yeah. Now, yeah. it's basically Intel, and you have physical operating systems and virtual operating systems, and then you have a set of control path functions. We all hoped that SMIS was going to solve these problems, it didn't. Amitai was on yesterday talking about this, and his comment was, you don't have to be open source to be open. That's true. And so, you, what, you're referring, what you're yeah. referring to is, yeah, you can play in open source as a contribution, so the communities of open source sure, are, are a good benchmark to balance. I knew I liked that balance. Amitai guy. I knew yeah, I liked he's it. solid, yeah. He's he, solid, he's yeah, good yeah. guy. And he's he, one of the family. <laughs> yeah. John Rose is impressive too. He was yeah. he was pretty impressive. And he talked about the service provider market, saying, hey, that stack, you can't just move that across the enterprise. That's right. And he was talking more about you know, those components. Um, does that affect your business? Or are you still plugging into the normal? normal? So, so we'll plug into all these uh, these management frameworks. And you know, we, we have seen forever and for all time the notion that quote storage is a commodity. And and what people mean by that when you really unravel it is the disk is a commodity. You know, what we do is hard. It's yeah. just hard. And the beautiful, and when I hire somebody uh, in my office, I have this disk drive, because I'm an old guy, <laughs> and, I, and I hold this disk drive up and I ten, say. 10 meg. <laughs> <laughs> I hold this disk drive up and I go, you know why we have a business? And they're like, why? Inquisitive luck. I go, because this thing doesn't work. <laughs> this disk drive, and you know what? It never worked. And the day it's born, it slowly decays. And our whole existence as a business has been, how do we ensure that your data is protected from this underlying substrate that doesn't work? And I say to you, my whole career has been defined by this disk drive, but your whole career is defined by this flash drive. And the good news for you is, it works worse. Yeah. So, <laughs> and decays <laughs> from the tradition. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and when it does decay, it goes. So, yeah, it doesn't there, work you better. have a long career yeah. ensuring people's data. So, on the, on, the, <laughs> on the career side, let me ask you that, because you know, obviously, Flash is changing the game from a software standpoint. So, I mean, you've been directing engineers, you've been doing a lot of organic R&D and innovation on your side, as well as doing some good M&A stuff. But, so, you, as you hire new software engineers, I mean, old was pretty classic software development. Now, and disk drives were working for the latency issues of memory, now it's flipped around. Disks and memory are, have the symbiotic relationship with Flash. Mm -hmm. um, so, does that change the hiring it's, it's and the system profile? Design. It's system design, right? I mean, um, in fact, our internal word for it, our internal group, it's probably not outside my group, we call them stonemason, right? And why is that? So if you go to Europe or you know, any place in the East Coast or whatever, you have these old churches. And if you tried to build a church today, you couldn't do it. Yeah. And they worked on these projects for hundreds of years and they were works of art. 
And so we're looking for stonemasons. So if you're a stonemason, we're looking for you. <laughs> and what we mean by that is great system architects that, that see the entire system in their head and understand you know, principles of latency and architecture and NUMA and memory management and you know, it's basically operating system internals. When you look at my team, they're what I was 30 years ago, operating system internal developer. Yeah, systems management's coming back and I mean yeah, basically it's, all the same. it's an operating system. It's an operating system, you got it, it's the same skills. Okay, we're here inside the Cube Region of Palatano, president, friend of the Cube, always great insight. And obviously, the keynote is online. You can always get the replay on EMC TV. Um, here in the Cube, we just go a little bit deeper, a little bit more casual, really kind of distracting out the signal from the noise. I'm here with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of EMC World Day Three. We'll be right back. If you're a stonemason, we want you. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> awesome. Good job.